for a bright future in the woods. Investment industry and uh, investment interest in forests has probably never been greater. It is being seen by potential investors as a properly green investment, which ticks all the right boxes as far as their corporate and social responsibility uh, lies, uh, helps deliver on climate change targets. And of course, being a really tangible investment, it's going to always be there. It's not going to be something that just disappears at the flick of a computer switch. This means that there's no shortage of those who are out there looking to become forest owners or woodland creators. And one of the challenges in meeting these new government planting targets and the investment uh, uh, aims of a lot of potential investors out there is supply. Where is this land going to come? You've muted yourself. There we go. Sorry, Sorry Raymond, you're, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, I don't know why that happened. I was nowhere near the screen, but anyway. Right, uh, uh, wh wh where had I got to? Um, yeah, in order to land. So yeah, there, there, there is a shortage of land out, out, out there. How, how are we going to actually go about finding land for conversion to woodland? Uh, how are, uh, how are we going to find the, 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 and attract people to the industry to actually work these uh, expanding areas of woodland? And how do we best look after the woodland resource that we have? So to help answer those questions, I'm delighted that we have presentation, uh, uh, presentations from Hamish Trench, Chief Executive of the Scottish Land Commission, uh, Gillian Clark, CEO of uh, FISA, and Josh Roberts from Forests and Land Scotland. Hamish was previously with the Cairngorms National Park Authority, uh, with the Deer Commission for Scotland, and uh, uh, also grudgingly admits to having formerly been a chartered surveyor. Uh, the Scottish Land Commission is driving a programme of land reform spanning both urban and rural land to improve the productivity diversity and accountability of the way Scotland's land is owned and used. And Hamish is going to, to speak to us today about regional land use partnerships. So over to you Hamish, thanks. Thanks, and, uh, thanks very much for the invitation to join you today. Um, it's very good to be with you all. Um, I'm just going to try sharing my screen just now if you bear with me for a minute just to get um, the slides up here. Um, here we go. Um, so I think, can someone just tell me that you're seeing that okay? Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take it, I'll take it if you can, yep. Good, I'm gonna talk through today um, the advice that um, the Scottish Land Commission is giving to the government on regional land use partnerships. Now, I had expected when we agreed to do this that we'd actually have published our advice um, just ahead of this meeting um, in fact, it's taken us a wee bit longer, um, but actually I do expect that we'll be publishing it uh, later this week. So effectively, I'm giving you a kind of a, a preview heads up on what's in our advice to Scottish Government um, about regional land use partnerships. Uh, and I suppose the, the first thing to say by way of context is that this is something that the Scottish Government asked the Commission to provide advice on this year. Um, how land use partnerships are taken forward is very much a matter for Government in terms of deciding exactly how and when they intend to do this. Um, and the next steps are for them to set out. But what I'll do tonight is just take you through the direction of the, the advice and the approach that we're proposing for this. And if we just kind of go back to the context, so where does this come from? Where does the idea of regional land use partnerships come from? Um, it's been around for quite a while. Um, Scotland's land use strategy in 2016 first set out the proposal that Scotland should have a set of regional partnerships and regional frameworks to really drive forward the land use strategy on the ground. Um, but that never quite happened for various reasons at the time. Um, but I think it's fair to say that the, the Climate Change Act in 2019 put rocket boosters under the idea again. Um, and, and not least because delivering Scotland and the UK's climate targets clearly relies on a huge contribution from the land use sector. Um, and obviously forestry is a significant part of that. Um, but that really brought the, the kind of the need to give traction to the land use strategy on the ground back into the, the political and public debate again. 
and the Scottish Government at that point committed to taking forward regional land use partnerships um, as part of the Climate Change Act in 2019. Um, since that time, obviously, we've also had, in terms of context, the Land Rights Responsibility Statement in 2017, and together that with the land use strategy provides a really clear kind of articulation of, of the public interest in land in Scotland and a really clear framework for addressing how we can actually take some of these things forward to deliver on Scotland's land use ambitions. But I think the final thing I'd say by way of context is, is clearly um, when we started this work, the headline from government was, was understandably all about climate change. I think that is probably matched now by the need to pitch this in terms of recovery and renewal. Uh, and certainly in what we're recommending for how land use partnerships could be established, um, I think the, you know, the need for them to actually contribute significantly to economic uh, regional uh, economic recovery and resilience is, is up there with equal importance to the climate and environmental um, targets for land use. I think we've got a real window of opportunity over the coming year um, to really better join up the way land use decisions are made um, in a more strategic way in Scotland. Um, and it's quite an exciting time, actually, if we look ahead to the next year. Um, so not only do we have the real clarity and challenge of climate targets, um, we also have a new land use strategy coming into place next year. Um, alongside that, we have a new national planning framework, um, the next one coming into place next year. Um, and the two of those together can set a real, um, real agenda for spatial delivery of land use targets in Scotland. Ah. At the same time, we've got regional spatial strategies being developed. Um, these come out of the Planning Act uh, and, and our new regional articulations of spatial and development planning. Um, and of course, we've got um, decisions being made uh, looking ahead to post-CAP rural and environment funding. So if you take all that together, there is a huge opportunity over the coming year, um, not only to shape significant direction, but to really join things up um, in a way that people have been looking to do, I think, for quite some time. So with that in mind, um, we have set about over the last year engaging widely on what regional land use partnerships should look like. So the government committed to, to the concept of regional land use partnerships. And as I say, the idea has been around for some time with quite strong stakeholder support from, from across sectors on the need to have some form of regional implementation um, of the land use strategy. So really appreciated over the last few months um, the engagement that we've had right across different sectors and interest groups. Um, through a series of online workshops, webinars, um, and, and the interim report that we published. Uh, we also have commissioned a bit of a couple of extra bits of work to, to support this work. Um, we've looked at the existing experience in Scotland. Uh, there are all sorts of initiatives, as you will well know in Scotland, in terms of integrating land use and bringing together collaborations um, around strategic land use planning. Uh, and there's lots that we can learn and have learned from that. Um, and we also commissioned some work to look internationally, just to see how do other countries um, approach this kind of regional scale land use planning uh, and what can we learn from that. And those two reports will be published alongside our, our advice um, when that comes out in the next few days. So if I jump straight to kind of a summary of the, the direction of this and the recommendations, um, the key things that we are saying to government that we think land use partnerships need to do if they're going to be effective um, first of all, they need to be clearly focused on stimulating action and delivery uh, and upping the pace and scale of delivery to meet the ambitious climate targets that we've got. Um, this is not just about a planning function. Um, they really need to connect in to, to levers of change that will deliver on the ground. And with that in mind, we think they need to connect directly to levers of funding and finance um, to be effective and to have impact. And in particular, we have in mind there some of the post-cap funding streams, uh, which I'll come back to. We think they need to integrate fully with established regional and spatial and economic planning. So Scotland already takes a regional approach to its economy strategy. Um, we have regional economic partnerships right across Scotland. Um, and I've already mentioned regional spatial strategies. Um, land use should absolutely be part of that um, normal regional economic planning. Uh, and I think it's really important that we increasingly link land use decisions and choices um, in with those other established planning processes. I think stating the obvious, to be effective, regional land use partnerships will need to be genuinely empowered to make decisions and, and prioritise at a regional and local scale. Um, and yes, of course, that does imply some tensions between regional and national decision making, um, which is at the heart of, of working out how this approach um, can work. Uh, and likewise, of course, they need to be well connected to local delivery. So whether that's uh, individual landowners and land managers, whether that's existing collaborative approaches, um, there's all sorts of organisations, collaborations, initiatives on the ground across Scotland that will be able to deliver the kind of land use changes 
that, that Scotland is looking for, uh, and regional partnerships will need to not only tap into, but actually make it easier um, for those mechanisms to, to get on and deliver things. So I'll focus now on, on the four key areas of recommendations that we're making to government on this. And, and these are about the purpose and function of the proposed partnerships, um, the geography of the partnerships, uh, the governance, uh, and then the implementation. So if I just say a bit first about the, the purpose and function, um, and I think, again, the, the stakeholder engagement that we've had over the last year on this, there is actually huge ambition out there across all sorts of people for what regional land use partnerships could do. Um, I think it's also fair to say there's probably a huge variation in different perspectives on exactly what a partnership should be and how it should operate. Um, and really part of the challenge for, for us over the last year has been to bring that into land on a, on a proposal that we can make to government um, that is pragmatic and, and will be able to get up and running over the next year. But I think running through all that, there is a real recognition that these partnerships need to drive collaboration and join up land use decisions. And at the heart of this is really the function of the partnerships in developing a regional land use framework. Um, and that framework um, should be a spatial plan that sets out the, the priorities, the, the opportunities, the choices and tensions in land use um, for a given part of Scotland. Um, and that, of course, is something that the forestry sector is, is arguably a step ahead in terms of integration of land use and looking at some of the, the recent work, for example, around the south of Scotland, Woodland Opportunity Mapping. Um, or some of the, the obviously the, the existing kind of experience on forest and woodland frameworks um, has a lot to, to offer in terms of the basis for taking that kind of spatial regional approach. But importantly, I think it, the partnerships can't stop there. It's not just about setting out a plan or a framework. Um, I think to really drive delivery and drive the kind of collaboration that's needed to make these things happen, um, the partnerships will need to have a role in prioritizing and targeting delivery of particular funding streams. Uh, we certainly think that should be some of the, the post-cap funding streams um, that particularly lend themselves to the kind of place-based approach. So I've no doubt that some funding streams will continue to be nationally applied and consistent, but equally some parts of funding uh, are much more effectively targeted, spatially in different parts of Scotland. Uh, and that, of course, is a role, a core role that a, a, a regional partnership um, could have. But I wouldn't also limit it to public funds. Um, clearly delivering the kind of land use change we need over the coming years is going to need investment from all sorts of different sources um, and particularly at the moment we can see the kind of increase in the development of for example um, natural capital funding streams um, and I see no reason at all why regional land use partnerships as they become more established um, couldn't be the kind of focal point for collaboration that really brings together funding and finance from multiple different sources to deliver the land use ambitions for a given part of Scotland um, and then that final point really is, is about the, the role for brokerage and, and collaboration. Uh, and this is something that came through very strongly in the feedback we've had over the course of the year, that people really see a really strong role for these partnerships uh, in providing that kind of brokerage function, uh, connecting up opportunities, um, opportunities with different delivery partners, with different finance opportunities, et cetera. Uh, the kind of things that, for example, um, national park authorities or bodies like Tweed Forum and others are already very good at doing in some parts of Scotland um, and extending that kind of brokerage function um, to help deliver um, land use uh, ambitions and targets. So one of the questions, of course, that everybody asks, first of all, is, is well, what are the scale of these partnerships? Um, what, uh, what's the geography of them? Um, some people have argued strongly that they should reflect natural kind of catchment boundaries, others administrative boundaries. And um, we'll be saying to government, we think um, they should be aiming for a phased establishment of about 12 to 15 partnerships that cover all of Scotland, uh, and that these should cover both urban and rural Scotland, and there are some really important connections to make there. Um, and we'll be saying that we think the, the logical starting point is to base them on planning authority areas, particularly so that they have traction and can join up with wider economic uh, and spatial planning. And that's one of the lessons from international practice is that these things are, are work best when they're joined up at that kind of regional and local government scale. The other key question, of course, is around governance and, and what do these partnerships look like? Um, what kind of body are they? Um, we think they need to be sufficiently independent from any individual sector interest. Um, so we're suggesting a, a kind of board of the partnership that is drawn from three pools. Uh, it certainly needs um, public bodies and government um, representatives um, in there. It 
certainly needs individuals with experience of relevant sectors um, and relevant issues. Um, and it certainly needs um, community and individual representatives to, to connect decisions with actually the, the places on the ground um, and the wider interests of people living in that area. So we're proposing a kind of three a three way split in terms of how a partnership board might be established and um, drawn from those three three groups. Um, and of course, that would need to be underpinned by by a body. And we think there's, again, plenty of experience and lots of existing bodies in Scotland that could um, provide that underpinning um, accountability um, in actually setting up and running um, the partnerships. And I think finally, the, the point to note on governance and and again, I can't offer a kind of full answer to this at this point, but clearly there are, um, there will continue to be tensions between national targets and, and regional objectives. Um, and so as we set up regional land use partnerships, there would need to be a national group that starts to bring together the partnerships and keeps oversight of whether Scotland is delivering on its national ambitions and national targets, um, and whether there is a, a relatively fair distribution um, of delivery um, and finance indeed across the partnerships across different parts of Scotland. So then the final area just to touch on um, in this kind of whistle stop tour of, of the proposals is really around implementation and, and how do we see these things being established and how do we see this going forward. And as I say, this is very much for Scottish Government to advise on the next steps of how they are looking to do this. But what we'll be suggesting is that the government works with parts of Scotland that are essentially ready to go as early adopters over the coming year. Um, we know there are many parts of Scotland that are already part way to doing this kind of approach um, and there are many parts of Scotland that have, have been quite clear through the last year that they would be keen to establish regional land use partnerships um, early uh, and get this approach up and running. And I think there's huge value to be gained in, in just running with some of those bits of Scotland that are ready to go, being relatively flexible about how that happens and being willing to learn from that um, as we go and feed that learning back into to rolling it out across Scotland. I don't think it's practical to try and roll out um, this approach kind of consistently all across Scotland at the same time. Um, I think it's going to be really important to learn from, from early experience. But having said that, I think it's also important that ultimately all of Scotland um, is covered and there, there is a potential issue of fairness, um, of course, in the parts of Scotland that are well set up to, to take this forward quickly. Um, equally, other parts of Scotland shouldn't lose out simply because they don't have existing capacity um, to, to take forward this approach. So I think while we're saying that um, we would envisage land use partnerships getting up and running in 2021, we're really looking to the period between now and 2023 um, to get partnerships up and running across all of Scotland. Um, and that timescale reflects both the, the next climate change plan update due in 2023, um, but also the, the timeline for looking at post-cap funding. Um, so any role in relation to finance would be considered as a, an integral part of any changes looking to the, the transition of post-cap funding um, by 2024. So I suppose really what I'm saying in terms of implementation, there are, there are parts of Scotland that are raring and ready to go on this uh, and a lot of experience already in place. Um, but it will take, I think, two or three years um, to fully develop the approach. Uh, and there is still obviously quite a lot to work out in terms of the practicalities um, of implementation. So oh, that's a, a kind of whistle stop tour, as I say, a bit of a preview of um, the advice that we're giving to government on regional land use partnerships. Um, clearly, I think this is something that you know, has huge potential to develop and evolve. And really, we're at the early stages of working out how should this kind of approach be put in place, what's going to be effective. Um, but it's clear from discussions over the last year that people have really quite wide ambitions for what this kind of regional approach um, to land use decision making could deliver in Scotland. Um, and I think there'll be some, some very interesting work ahead uh, in taking that forward. Um, final thing to say, I will, of course, uh, I'll let Jamie know as soon as our report is published in the next few days so that he's able to circulate that to you and you'll be able to read in more detail um, about these proposals. Um, but very happy to, to discuss any of that further uh, and take any questions just now. Jamie, thank you very much for um, an excellent summary of, of where, you, where you're going to. Um, we had a, a couple of questions submitted before the, the event, uh, one from Fenning Wellstead, who unfortunately has uh, had to uh, take a, a, a medical appointment. Um, 
he was asking what steps are being or can be taken to encourage a more mixed farming forestry landscape and will post Brexit support schemes embrace and facilitate this. Now, do, do you see the land use par partnerships being able to, uh, you know, to influence this, uh, this question? Yes, I do. I suppose I see them being having quite a strong role in actually encouraging much greater integration and joining up. Um, I mean, we, we have to we have to in this, I think, be upfront about the fact that there are tensions and choices in land use. Um, and you know, going back to, to Raymond's introduction about the supply of land for forestry, we are asking a huge amount of our land in Scotland at the moment. There are all sorts of competing tensions on it um, from all sorts of different perspectives. Um, and I think the role that these regional partnerships can play is to bring those out much more into the open and be much more transparent about what the choices are, what the trade-offs are, um, what the implications are. Um, and, and hopefully in doing that, bring a bit more dynamism to actually making some of these, these choices happen and delivering on the, the targets that we have. So I can't, obviously can't speak to where post-Brexit funding might go, but I would very much hope that it, this will all support that uh, direction of greater integration. And Mike Perks had um, touched on this as well by, by asking whether, well, in effect asking whether the contributors could address the question of resilience in the, in the landscape. Do you think this um, new idea of regional land use partnerships are, are going to be enhancing the um, resilience of, of our landscape? Um. Without getting into precisely what definition of resilience, but but in in general terms, I'd have thought it can only help if if these partnerships provide the space and forum to really explore the the implications of different land use choices, um, and understanding what will strengthen or weaken that resilience in different parts of Scotland. And, and I suppose that's part of the point is that the answers to that could be very different in different parts of Scotland. Um, and, and underlying all of this is the sense that you know, a national land use strategy is hugely important, but it's not enough. Um, you, you can't possibly make all these trade-offs and decisions at a national level, and neither can you fairly expect an individual land manager to, to take them all on their shoulders either. So the regional scale offers a kind of a sensible scale at which you can really understand the kind of choices, trade-offs and implications of, of these you know, different land use options. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm just having a quick look around the screen to see if anyone has put their hands up and I don't see anybody. Uh, so, um, Hamish, thank you again very much for that. I, I hope that um, our sector will step up to the mark and uh, when these um, uh, partnerships start get get going that um, we will ensure that in every region that they are established there will be a strong voice for for forestry but uh, I, I've no doubt that uh, many people in the room at the moment and I think we are 94 at the moment um, will be interested in taking part so Hamish thank you very much indeed um, I would now like to uh, hand back to Raymond to introduce our next speaker. Yes, thanks very much, Hamish. Um, as we're all aware, health and safety and welfare of, uh, of uh, workers in the sector are uh, absolutely crucial. They're crucial for any industry and forestry is certainly no exception. With the increasing need to attract people into every part of forestry, Ensuring high standards of health and safety and welfare are in place and are being met is going to be vital in protecting all of us and in promoting forestry as a nice place to actually work. Gillian Clark, who's the Chief Executive Officer of FISA, uh, joined FISA in 2013, uh, will now give us an update on uh, developments. Uh, uh, FISA is a very active organization and uh, uh, I know they've been doing a lot of work uh, over, over uh, the, the, the last period on things like welfare. Uh, Gillian is, um, has a background in agriculture, uh, in haulage and in construction and spends part of her busy life as the CEO of FISA uh, but still does have uh, uh, um, fingers in the pie in agriculture and haulage. Uh, 
So I can hand over to you, Gillian. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to focus today on the guidance on managing health and safety in forestry and give you a brief update on welfare and also touch on the key priorities that we're actually seeing as the main focus for FISA at the moment. Um, so if I can just go to the share screen just to um, work on that. Okay, as I've just said, I'm going to focus on the guidance on managing health and safety in forestry and uh, welfare and then particularly on chainsaw competency levels. Okay, so I'm conscious that a number of you are more related at the landowner level, but obviously the guidance in managing health and safety in forestry does touch on the roles for all different duty holders within the sector. So I've focused this presentation on the landowner, but certainly as you're all aware, the key role is really the FWM, but as I felt that it was going to be more the landowner attendance group on this call, that's what I've focused on. So the landowner is the person, the group, the business or organisation that is in control of the land. So it's not necessarily the person that actually ultimately owns the land. And of course, a number are represented by an agent and an agent should be a competent person authorised to act for you, for the landowner in that capacity. As I've mentioned, the FWM is a key role in managing health and safety during forestry. The landowner also has got a number of important responsibilities. The main one of that is to ensure they get a competent FWM. If you engage a contractor directly, then you're actually taking on the role of FWM. And are you actually competent to do that? When appointing an FWM yourself, you must check that the FWM is competent to plan and implement the work so that it will be carried out safely and it won't affect the health and safety of others. So the FWM role is really key to managing a site safely. If you're employing the services of a forestry business like a timber purchaser or a forestry agent or a forest management company, then they will take on the role of FWM and they should assign an experienced or competent person to the role. You're also, as the landowner, you need to provide information to the FWM. Much of this information is safety critical and it should be included at the earliest opportunity and wherever possible in any sales or tender particulars. So, for example, it's items like the location and nature of any hazards on your land, any measures that you have already put in place to reduce the risk of the hazards, and possibly any work constraints. You're also still involved in coordinating activities. Yourself and the FWM must ensure that different activities on your land do not conflict or get in each other's way to the detriment of health and safety. Yourself and the FWM should liaise with others involved to communicate your plans and coordinate your activities. You do need to be involved and control changes. Landowners should ensure that arrangements agreed to ensure that safety of those working in and using the forestry site are put in place and maintained for the duration of the forestry work. Unexpected changes can introduce new risks. So you need to be alert for changes and other activities on your land that may affect the forestry work or the access routes. We're certainly entering a period of time at the moment with autumn, winter, heavy rainfall, possible snow and ice, where these sort of changes can impact a site. You need to be involved in monitoring standards. As the landowner, you're not expected to directly supervise the work, that's the FWM's role. However, you do need to keep in regular contact with the FWM to ensure communication is working effectively. It's also good practice to periodically monitor 
that the safe working practices proposed by the FWM are actually being delivered on site. FISA has got in draft two new FISA safety guides for the landowner sector. They'll be coming out shortly. That's FISA 801 for the landowner and 801A for the landowner's agent. These are brand new safety guides and these will provide supplementary advice on how guidance in managing health and safety and forestry, the landowner and the agent legal obligations can be met. So these safety guides are there to offer extra advice, particularly on good practice. We've also taken feedback into the landowner working group recently on a topic called safety before price. This was quite a political um, item to put out there to the industry and that feedback is in the current um, stage of being looked at the next steps. So that working group are considering a new landowner code of conduct. They're also looking at the focus on the need for FWM CPD. FWM CPD is a topic in its own right that sits with the skills and development working group and will be progressed over the next 12 to 18 months. Increased communication of FISA recommendations is also an item that the landowner working group have flagged up. And again, that's something that FISA are trying to do going forwards. Moving on to FISA 806, the welfare guidance. Now that guidance was a brand new guide. Again, it did generate a lot of feedback. That guide sits with a feedback period, even though it is actually out there published. It will take feedback up until June 2021. And certainly what we've done from the feedback received today is put out safety bulletins, answering a number of those queries and questions that have been raised to date. I've pulled out some of the key discussion points that I thought you're likely to want to consider. Um, one in particular is the cost of welfare. The cost is part of the business's overheads, a bit like PPE, fuel and insurance. So ultimately, the landowner does pay for the welfare because it's part of the operation costs. And it also is there as part of guidance on managing health and safety and forestry. And it's, it's quoted in that guide as well. So the FWMs must ensure that all welfare provisions and any payment arrangements, including for example, shared welfare facilities, we certainly get a lot of queries in to do with when a site switches from harvesting into haulage. So there is certainly that coordination that has to happen. So these need to be agreed at the pre-work planning stages and workers must not be charged for using any welfare facilities at work. A cooperative approach is needed because certainly sites do move between different stages during harvesting and planting. So quite often you will see a number of contractors sharing the site or following on one to the next. So by working together, you can often end up with an effective solution. The person in control of the forestry work, usually the FWM, is ultimately responsible for coordinating the assessment and the provision and the use of shared welfare facilities. If shared arrangements change during the work, for example, when a facility provider leaves site, or if more people arrive on site, the FWM must review the assessment and arrange for reasonable and suitable adjustments to allow the work to continue. Facilities can also be shared by different FWMs running different coops nearby, provided that they're suitable and sufficient for the numbers and those intended to use them. It is up to the FWM and the owner or the hire of the facilities to agree whether or how they will share the costs of providing them and maintaining the shared facilities. The FISA Chainsaw Project Working Group um, has been very active just recently and they reported in to the FISA Steering Group at their recent meeting. During 
the last 12 to 18 months, they have received agreement to support the working group recommendation of a chainsaw competency levels system. At the steering group meeting on the 13th of the 10th, so that's just very recent, um, there was agreement to support the site planning of chainsaw works by what's termed a level three chainsaw operative. So this is someone quite highly competent. This will be a phased adoption of this recommendation and there will be further planning before this recommendation is actually rolled out to the industry. That planning needs to continue to happen over the next 12 months and that will be undertaken by a subgroup involving chainsaw operatives, forest management companies, landowners. So this is not going to be brought in until the further planning is undertaken and an actual rollout date will be announced as that planning happens. So the chainsaw competency levels are something new to the industry. They are based on the chainsaw operative having the basic certifications. So they're not going away. But what the level system does, it takes in and can demonstrate and evidence how that chainsaw operative gains a level of competency through an increase in numbers of hours logged and also through an audit process annually. They will then record that. That can then be available to the FWM. So the FWM has got evidence of competency for those engaged on site. So I'm showing you the level one screen at the moment. So as you can see, it starts with level one at the basic level and it builds, we've now got level two. It builds to level three, which clearly you can see there is a split in level three because you've got ground base, you start to introduce some aerial work. Level three is deemed as the level that will be involved in the priest work planning. And that's because the level three will clearly be able to demonstrate a level of competence to walk that site and look at the chainsaw work to be involved on that site. Level three also has a steep ground element. Um, clearly we are seeing a lot of steep ground being accessed. Level four, again splits into the different elements of the role. Level four will ultimately be able to audit along with some level threes. So this is brand new to the industry. It will take a period of time for this to be rolled out to industry. And again, it will be a phased approach. A number of sites have already been run under a pilot system successfully. So this system has already been tested on a number of pilot sites, but it will take a period of time for the industry to roll it out. And it will take a period of time for the level three and level four auditors to be available to the industry. The main difference is that all the auditors will be skilled and qualified auditors, but they'll also be experienced chainsaw operatives. So that's the big difference in the way this will work. It will supersede the chainsaw refresher. So going forward, people who have undertaken that will not have to repeat that if they transfer across to the level system. FISA has put out to the industry the outline of this system, along with the outline of what an audit process will involve and also an outline of what an auditor will need to be. FISA is not giving any recommendation to an exclusive of who or where you go to get this system, but FISA is offering the recommendation that if you want to go to digital, the example is Safe Forest, you've worked with us, but that is not exclusive. It is down to the user to choose how and where they follow this system through. And we do not expect everyone 
to be running with this system immediately. It will be a phased in rollout system. Chainsaw operatives who are already very experienced and already carry a level of skill and competency will not start at level one. They will be audited and put into the equivalent level of where they sit. So I've just had a very brief run through everything there. Um, and I'm conscious that it's not been a huge amount of detail. The documents will be linked to the post meeting um, paperwork that you receive. So any questions do get in touch. Julian, thank you very much. Um, we have um, gone through a transformational period over the last five to ten years and uh, thank you for all your work and um, all the people who contribute to your considerable number of work groups to get where we are. Now, Gillian, when you and I were um, talking earlier today, you anticipated there might be a, a few questions coming your way, but uh, I can't, no one has as yet put anything into the, uh, into the chat box. Uh, is there anything that uh, you would like to uh, feel you, uh, would need to expand on. Um, now, hang on, I've just um, got a message from Malcolm. How will trainees be allowed on for sites? Well, Malcolm and everybody else, trainees obviously will be um, under what we're terming a consolidation period, which they will be encouraged to have um, supervision there that will obviously be there to supervise and help that trainee and they will start at the very basic level of that they will not be audited until they have gone through that consolidation and initial certification route but we are also encouraging that was voted through at a much earlier steering group meeting that all people who are even going to the certification route do undertake a six month consolidation period where they're heavily supervised to try and encourage that people learn these skills a little bit more. Thank you. Uh, uh, Simon Oldham, I see you've got a, a question. Would you like to uh, open up and um, pose it to Gillian? Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, um, I can. Uh, thanks. Yeah, it was just a question, uh, Gillian. Uh, I'd heard a little bit about this, but I hadn't heard the, the detail that this was going to re re uh, replace the requirement for refresher training. Can you just expand on the logic of that, please? Um, yes. This, the refresher training will remain for the occasional user who may sit almost up to a level one as in the person who doesn't meet that initial 500 hours, which there is a large part of the sector, forest rangers, these types of people. So they will still need to be able to demonstrate that their skills are kept up to date. So the refresher will remain to a certain extent for the um, occasional user. But what we will look at, if they're an occasional user, they should consider bringing their refresh a cycle down to three years because if they're not picking the saw up as often then are they as competent as someone who's using it day in day out um i you know that's just a question that we're raising to industry and um, the idea behind the chainsaw refresher is that if you are undergoing an audit annually that should supersede the refresher because it should be over and above a refresher that currently runs three to five yearly so that was the thinking behind that. Okay, so it's an annual audit would replace it, basically. Yes. But some people will choose to do this in-house through their own systems. Some um, larger contract groups may well have a level three or a level four working in their teams already. So this isn't going to be as difficult to achieve as I think people are thinking at this outset. 
because a number of those level threes and level fours will be currently operatives on site. That's the difference with this system. It's trying to actually bring that level of skill to someone who's regularly using the saw themselves. Thank you, Julian. Um, slight switch of emphasis um, from uh, Katie is asking, do welfare units need to be unlocked on site? or can they be locked with a designated key holder to ensure track and trace is undertaken? You, you forgive me if I'm wrong, you didn't really touch much on COVID when you, when you were um, covering. Okay, yeah. Um, I'd just like to say also, we have a lot of COVID guidance on the FISA website and it's thanks to the COVID working group for that. And certainly Jamie, I know it's shared with Comforum wider. So that's, purposely there for everyone to have access to. But yes, the overlap to welfare. Welfare, the hand washing facilities are obviously part of those control measures. So it is essential, they are available to all. And you do need through your risk assessment to consider how you can keep that unit easily available so they can wash the hands. It is recommended that hand washing is a better option than just relying on the alcohol gels all the time. The alcohol gels have got a place, they do serve a purpose, but ultimately hand washing at some point during the day is better. So they do need to be accessible. So if that is with a nominated key holder, I've seen some people put key, um, even a bike chain to them with a key number code, but bear in mind, they need to be able to wipe that off as well. I have seen some that have actually just glued um, some Dettol wipes, I'm sure there's other brands available, to the side of the unit outside and people can pull a wipe, wipe off the handle, wipe off the lock, access it, put that in the bin and then it's ready for the next person. So again, just use some element of, of how it can work. Um, yes, please don't lock the unit so that it can't ever be used. We've had comments uh, through our regular supply chain meetings, which a summary of which uh, we, we um, put out with uh, every e-news, that the providers of welfare units have been profiteering slightly with the current situation. Have you had feedback like that, Gillian? Um, yes, we have. Um, we do um, a weekly update to members and twice we've featured it recently. There's been an awful backlog of people who've even got units ordered. They've had to rely on um, the TARDISes in between, strap some together. People have, have come up with some good solutions, but ultimately, yes, they've been held a little bit to ransom and actually getting newly bought units fitted out. There has been a large backlog, partly, I think, in the backlog of just you know, lockdowns affecting manufacture as much as anything. Um, so you may have to think a little bit outside the box to get a facility on site, but please a bucket and a spade and a loo roll on a stick does not suffice. Um, you know, you may have to hire in the TARDISes short term if you're awaiting your own bought in unit. Well, with that uh, sanitary lesson, uh, I think we will draw uh, this particular session to a close. Thank you very much, Gillian, for your time. Um, I obviously pay homage to, uh, again, to all, all you do uh, in FISA. Keep, keep going. Uh, back to you, Raymond, to introduce our next speaker. Yes, thanks very much, Gillian. Uh, so on to, on to the, the next and final speaker, uh, New Woodland Creation and the sustainable management of our existing woods uh, obviously relies on a lot of things falling into place. But supply of plants and ensuring that the trees that we have are, are, uh, are given the best possible chance of thriving have got, has got to be well up that list. The increased levels of New Woodland Creation and of uh, timber harvesting uh, through clear felling uh, is leading to more restocking, of course, and, uh, and that's putting pressure on plant availability. Restock sites often have the additional challenge of weevil damage risk to contend with. And Josh Roberts of Forestry and Land Scotland is going to talk to us today about optimizing the seed resource and minimising weevil damage. Over to you, Josh. 
Thanks, Raymond. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, see you okay. Thanks, Josh. Brilliant. Okay, thanks. Can you see that okay? Yeah. Yeah, that's coming through. Yep. Well done. Brilliant. Okay. Um, still got my presentation up? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, that's coming in. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Josh Roberts, and I'm the Innovation Manager for Forestry and Land Scotland. Uh, I'm here to tell you about two research projects that I've been coordinating over the last few years, which are likely to have a bearing on the forest industry. Uh, the first is how to apply technology to improve the management of the large pine weevil, Hylobia sabetes, and the other is how we've been working to increase the efficiency and productivity in the forest nursery sector so that we can ensure adequate supplies of high quality planting stock and uh, good management of that seed resource. So I'm aware that many of you will be familiar with the problem of Hylobius. Uh, some of you will be partially familiar and there will be others in the audience who aren't familiar at all with this pest. So I'm going to start very briefly from the beginning and discuss what it is and why it is such a problem. Uh, pine weevils are forest dwelling insects that lay their eggs in dead wood that is in contact with the ground and once the eggs hatch the larvae feed, grow and pupate in the inner layer of the wood. The adults then emerge looking to feed on the new growth of living woody plant material. Here you can see a uh, image of a typical restocking site and it's quite obvious from this photo that significant quantities of dead wood are usually available on a restocking site and this provides prime habitat that allows vast numbers of hungry adult weevils to emerge in that landscape for several years after felling. The emerging weevils find the replanted or regenerated trees on the site to be the most immediate food source. Feeding around the stem disrupts flow of nutrients in the tree and can quickly ring bark a sapling. It's possible for 100% of trees to be killed in this way for several years after felling has occurred. Uh, and this is a problem that's experienced across a wide geographic area. It reportedly causes 140 million euros worth of losses in the EU alone per year. And 40% of coniferous seedlings in Europe are treated with insecticides specifically for pine weevil before they're planted. That's an estimated 400 million trees per year, and the number that are treated for weevils after planting is unknown but suspected to be higher. Despite being a significant problem right across Europe, however, Scotland is thought to suffer from the worst known infestations anywhere in the world. We're now seeing examples of 10 year old trees up to three meters in height being killed as a result of weevil damage in the worst cases. And these are some photos. The situation is becoming harder to manage as controls on chemical usage become stricter. Warmer temperatures lead to increased mobility, activity and reproductive rate. And as uh, plantations mature, the increased harvesting level creates more breeding habitat at a landscape level. So that's the scale of the problem. What do we currently do about it? The current approach to monitoring the severity of your infestation is to carry 24 cut logs, like you see in this photo, on foot over a site. You then arrange those logs in a unique formation on that site according to the individual site conditions, which is something that needs specialist training. You then visit those logs every week for a month, and the timing of the visits must be planned by somebody with a clear understanding of the site's history or the results are useless. You have to know accurately when all of the felling occurred Otherwise, you don't know enough about the site to use the system. It can't just be when the filling started or when it finished. You have to know when the filling occurred. You then manually count every weevil found on every log each week and record that information and input it into a population model. The system itself, known as the Hylobius Management Support System, is very accurate for single sites, but only if you use it correctly. There's a high scope for human error which undermines confidence in the system. Like anything, it's rubbish in, rubbish out. The alternative used by a significant proportion of the private sector is to plant trees immediately after felling, a practice known as hot planting. Um, you then carry out multiple prey, pesticide spraying operations, usually, often to the maximum allowable limit until the trees are established. 
it is widely known that hot plant and spray does not yield the best financial performance of the site, let alone environmental. And many of the managers following that practice openly admit that it is done for simplicity, especially in client relationships. And others have accepted it as industry norm without even much questioning. When it comes to protecting the trees, chemical insecticide use is by far the most common and widespread option, either as pre-treated trees or as top-up sprays. The main chemical pesticide uses a neonicotinoid class of pesticides, a group of chemicals that is being banned in other situations due to links with bee decline. Forestry is considered low risk of harm to bees because the chemical is not being applied intentionally to flowering plants. However, it may still be at risk due to its off-label status, like basamid, which we'll cover later, and the usage of all chemicals without appropriate integrated pest management is becoming stricter and less acceptable. To actually reduce the population of weevils, pretty much the only option you have is to either wait and carry out a fallow period while it reduces naturally, or to use a nematode parasite as a biological control. Biological control is simply the use of a living organism to control a pest. For example, if you imagine a farm with a barn full of grain and a mouse problem, if that farm got a cat to control the mice, it would be said to be employing a biological control system. Simple as that. The key to making this biological control agent work, the nematode, is to keep it wet. Therefore, it needs to be applied with high volumes of water, meaning big, heavy, expensive equipment like that seen here. But it's not just the cost of the problem uh, of using this solution. A fully laden one of these machines is immensely heavy and driving one up a wet, steep site can be highly damaging to fragile soils or just not possible. Uh, I don't need to tell any of you that wet and steep are probably the defining characteristics of many forest sites in Scotland, so it hasn't been widely adopted. Taken together, we start to appreciate why this problem uh, has been such a problem for foresters, and in fact it's usually regarded as the most significant problem to re-establishing forests in Scotland. So to try and tackle this, I set up a project to sponsor the research and development of new products that would make management of Hylobius more effective. I was awarded an initial pot of funding from the Can Do Innovation Challenge Fund, which is a pot of money designed to help crack particularly difficult problems that have a negative impact on the Scottish low carbon economy, something that forestry fits with very well. So with this, uh, I put together a team of experts from Forestry and Land Scotland, Scottish Forestry, CONFOR, Forestry England, and the FC Research Commissioning Team. I also worked with other forest management companies wherever possible, notably Till Hill, to inform the project with additional perspectives beyond the public sector. With that team then, I put out a call for ideas uh, in late 2018 and received and reviewed many ideas from all around the world. From these, we selected five promising ideas to take forward for an initial round of testing. And those ideas went through a rigorous six months of laboratory, workshop and field trials to explore their potential. So although many of them produced tantalizing initial results, two approaches really stood out to us as the group. Both of those have been awarded contracts to carry out more extensive field trials over a two to three year period. And we're just at the end of that first year. Uh, and this has been part funded by the Can Do Fund and part funded by Forestry and Land Scotland. The crucial foundation to effective management of any pest is to detect and monitor the severity of the infestation. This is something which we can only currently do for Hylobius in a very limited way, and many foresters find this unsatisfactory with regard to the effort versus the accuracy. Therefore, both projects that we've funded include an element of developing improvements to the monitoring of the pest. The first products that we see emerging is a battery-powered Wi-Fi enabled camera trap. The unit will include software to identify and classify insects automatically and transmit data on weevil rates and activity in real time. This would provide accurate, continuous monitoring of a site along with other environmental data. So instead of assessing how bad the weevils on your site are by seeing how many and how quickly your trees get damaged and killed, it's hoped that this system will instead record the activity of the weevils themselves so that the site manager knows exactly when where and how severe the infestation is 
without having to visit the site on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. This means that if necessary, you can protect the crop before it is damaged or save you from spraying a whole coop if you actually don't need to because the weevils aren't there. The other project also uh, contains a lower, uh, lower trap element that could be used for monitoring. However, building on that base, it's also uh, building a trap that contains a biological control organism. So as I said, the main problem with using many biological controls, including the one that's used for this weevil, is that they dry out and are damaged by ultraviolet radiation. The remedy for this, as I've said, is to apply them with lots and lots of water. This second project that we're funding is investigating suspending those nematodes or another biological control agent in a gel instead of in the water. And then that gel would be used to coat the inside of a trap. The trap housing protects them from drying out and from the UV rays. The idea is that the weevils are lured inside using a sophisticated synthetic lure, coated with nematode gel, and then disperse. They become infected and eventually die, but before they do, they hopefully spread that infection to other members of the population before dying themselves, thereby spreading the lethal parasite across the site. Since I wrote this talk, um, we all become experts in epidemiology. Uh, and therefore this mechan mechanism of transmission is probably, unfortunately, quite familiar to us by now. But hopefully that allows us to understand that these protective baited traps could provide a relatively long-lasting reservoir of infectious agent that keeps reinfecting the population while that site establishes. If we can make this mechanism work, it would allow us to impact the population of weevils rather than just protecting the trees. In future, this could mean that many of the protective technologies that have previously been discounted due to the excessively high weevil densities that we find here in the UK could start to be considered again. So these products on their own aren't going to eliminate the need for foresters to think about weevils. But by focusing on understanding the pest's behaviour, monitoring its numbers, locations and timing, and finding a way to flatten the curve of the ultra-high population booms, we hope to gain some ground in tackling the fundamental causes of this problem. The objective is not to create a perfect product within the next two years, but to have got the product basics right and to have created something that adds enough value to foresters that we can move to a commercial relationship and build from there. This is not a research project. We are utterly focused on developing a market-based solution that works for real forest managers. I'm not expecting the first iteration of these products to provide every possible benefit that they could provide to every forest manager on every site in the first year. That's just not realistic. What I am trying to do is to provide a sustainable platform from which to launch a product that can be continually improved upon. To be successful, the products have to actually do the job that foresters beyond Forestry in Land Scotland will value. I will, therefore, I want to engage more private forestry companies about this project while it is still in development that's when the changes will most easily be made. And on that basis then, I'd be very interested in working with any of you in the audience who have an interest in finding a more sustainable solution to Halobius so that we can find, build a foundation of sound, sustainable management of this pest together. So I'm gonna pause briefly for questions on that topic before going on to talk about my second topic. Um, Jamie, how are we doing for questions? Uh, thanks, Josh. Um, you've held everyone spellbound. Um, I don't see any uh, questions coming up in the chat yet. Um, is it any, 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 any work which is going to uh, help control um, this pest is going to be very, very welcome, as uh, everyone um, here so, knows. Sorry, Jimmy, Josh, uh, can, I, can I just ask a quick question, please? Yes, of course. Jimmy Anderson here. Um, you said, Josh, that it was widely known that hot planting is perhaps not the most financially optimal solution to yes. uh, weevil control. Um, when you take into account that uh, fallow periods might have to be five years, possibly longer in some instances, uh, when you look at the, uh, the use of improved planting stock, uh, where we might be seeing rotation lengths for Sitka 
coming down to perhaps 35 years. Uh, when you take into account that a site that is left fallow for uh, five, six years, in some instances, will become really badly overgrown and require a lot more in the way of weed control, possibly more aggressive ground preparation and things in order to get the, the new crop of trees established. I'm, I'm actually surprised that, uh, um, that you're saying that it is widely known that hot planting isn't the most financially optimal solution. When the, when the full picture is taken into account, there is quite a strong case for hot planting in my view. No, no, yeah, sorry. It's not that it is always the wrong uh, choice, it's that it's not always the right choice. And yet there's a lot of factors that you need to take into account. And, um, you know, yes, the, um, you know, discounting to the present, the, the value that you would have had if those trees were growing, yes, the increase in, in weed growth, they are all factors. And it's quite difficult to in any, any aspect of forestry to oversimplify. So I'm not saying that hot plant is always the wrong choice. And we did a economic appraisal with um, an economist. We put in loads of information about site fertility with um, pesticides, herbicides, um, loss, well, not loss, but delayed income discounted to the kind of present. And that we found that was a separation between high fertility sites and low fertility sites on very fertile sites where you're getting excellent growth of timber, then you can afford to spend more money on establishing that site sooner because you're gonna get a higher return. Uh, so your very high yield class sites, then yeah, you can spend money on establishing that earlier. On your lower yield class sites, then you don't get the return in the end that justifies paying lots and lots of money to establish that site a few years earlier. You're better off reducing your expenditure at establishment waiting and because you're just not going to get the same return over the same period but where that cutoff point falls depends on what sort of price you're getting your labor where you you know how much your chemicals cost there we in the model we did i think it was somewhere around yield class 12 to 14 was the sort of gray area um and that sort of by the time you're getting well yeah it depends on how you do it for yield class 18 sitka, it was almost always better to, uh, and above, then, you know, yes, planting earlier and spending a bit more was justified and for yield class 12, but I, yeah, it kind of, it kind of depends. So it's, it should be widely known um, that hot planting is not the, always the right answer. It's, you know, it shouldn't be the default option. What you should do is you should look at your site, look at your own costs and decide on the appropriate restocking strategy for the site that you have and not just to will always spend all the money that we have on establishing a site as soon as possible because that is that is not the most cost effective um that, that's not going to yield the best financial performance hopefully that clarifies what i meant by that no thank you very much could i um add to that question josh that um there is a, a, there's a sort of carbon argument involved there as well, which I think is going to take a, a, a higher um, place in our thinking in, in, in the future. But I don't want to hog the, the scene. I've just a couple of other questions. Hamish Robertson asking, are you looking for sector sites uh, to test the nematode gel? Are we looking for what sort of sites, Jamie? Are you looking for private sector sites to trial the nematode? Yes, we would. You know, uh, yeah, I'd be very interested in if I could take your email address uh, at, you know, finding alternative sites, finding people that we can work with who are willing to give stuff a go while it's in development, before it's ready, you know, and um, that we can feed back into saying what works, what doesn't work. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, uh, Josh, thank you very much indeed. I I um, would like to move on to your, your, the second part of your presentation and uh, uh, about seeds, please. Okay, thanks, Jenny. So for the next part of my talk, I would like to share an update on another project related to tree production in forest nurseries. Before the pandemic, it was difficult for foresters to get all of the trees that they need to the right specification and on time. This has not been made easier over the last nine months. But in fact, the pressures have been building for some time. And about 18 months ago, there was real concern in the plant seed supply sector. And that's for a number of reasons. 
Firstly, stocks of seed for many species, but especially for Sitka, had almost completely run out. Sitka is a masting species, so supply is intermittent at the best of times. And as an industry, we go through boom and bust cycles in terms of seed stocks. And this time we were very close to bust. Secondly, the intense drought that we had in 2018 was the driest growing season on record. Until 2020 broke that record, but more on that later. This had a devastating impact on some nurseries. There are three major forest nurseries near Elgin, as is labelled on this map, and one of them is the FLS-run nursery called Newton. At Newton, 90% of the seeds that we sowed in 2018 didn't even germinate due to the heat and the drought. This cost us over half a million pounds in additional direct costs and caused a multi-year strain on making up that lost ground. The other is, as you mentioned, woodland creation. We are finally back at seeing woodland creation in Scotland regularly exceeding 10,000 hectares per year. But we all know that more is needed and more has been promised. The Committee on Climate Change that produced this report last year made recommendations to the government on woodland creation. The, the government took on their lower ambition recommendation to increase woodland creation to only 30,000 hectares per year for 30 years. This, should be none, this is going to be news to none of you, and I don't expect the scale of that challenge to have escaped any of you from whatever part of the industry you're from. It has been done before, but it hasn't been done regularly for nearly 50 years. We have become, as a sector, very used to having policy targets way, way above what is actually delivered, but we're all seeing demand for climate action growing. The events this year, far from pushing that work down the agenda, have seen it rise, and a green recovery to the current pandemic is being touted at the highest levels of the Scottish Government. We've all heard it before in terms of woodland creation targets, but what if this time they really mean it? Can we deliver? So rewind to 2019. Very few trees in the ground, thanks to the drought, a seed store cupboard almost bare, and the government has just accepted a 30,000 hectare woodland creation target. We needed to do something, otherwise we were gonna be in trouble. Since then, a lot has happened. At least three things have happened since then to nurseries in 2020 that on their own could have fallen, some could, could be you know, falling somewhere just short of catastrophe. However, despite what you might think, we seem tent you know, tentatively, amazingly, to have dodged a lot of those bullets, thanks to some well-timed interventions and also a lot of good luck. Obviously, coronavirus has had a huge impact on everyone, but peak lockdown coincided exactly with the seed sowing season for nurseries. We closed Newton in line with government procedure, and that meant that when we came out of lockdown, there was no new stock in the ground. The second thing was the weather. As I said, 2020 spring was set a new record for extreme weather and May 2020 was the uh, set, uh, claimed first place for the driest ever recorded. So even if the pandemic hadn't happened, we would probably still be in trouble with plant supplies. And the third thing, which if you look at the uh, CONFOR update is mentioned, is the loss of a chemical called basamid. Basamid is a highly toxic, toxic chemical that was used by nurseries to sterilize the ground of competing weeds before sowing. It has not been approved for further use and nurseries are now desperately looking for what to do next with no appealing obvious choices. This highlights again how vulnerable our industry is to off-label chemicals. The drive to more sustainable business practices and chemical reduction therefore needs to be seen by all of us as a story of both financial sustainability as well as environmental sustainability. So yeah, lots of pressure on plant supply. I'm going to use the limited time that I have left to talk in the main about just one of the things we've been trying to do about it. This is not the only thing we've been working on, but it's helped us to dodge those three major bullets that 2020 has fired at us. Following a similar approach to the pine weevil challenge, I set up a product development sponsorship program. The idea is that we covered the cost of inventing the thing that doesn't yet exist. Through that, we work with a number of great companies, uh, new and old, on some really interesting things. And by lucky coincidence, one of those things we've been working with uh, looked like it could help us with those three problems. And that is the tree tape system that has been mentioned in this month's uh, FTN magazine. The tree tape system 
works by sowing seed into a continuous biodegradable paper ribbon of compost filled pockets. Once sown, the ribbon of pockets is then placed in a glass house. Uh, this provides the young trees with optimum growing conditions in much the same way as a conventional container nursery. As I mentioned, during lockdown, we didn't know if we were going to get any new trees in the ground in 2020 at all due to losing that spring sowing window. But by shifting the germination into a glass house, it meant that the seedlings could be sown in the field later in the year, when it was hoped that restrictions would have eased and we stood a chance of getting any trees at all. So was that just shifting the problem somewhere else? Well, we think not, because the technology that was under development um, is, uh, it comes from the agricultural, uh, agricultural sector. So all of the elements that we were testing were being done in agricultural facilities. Uh, because this technology comes from the field grown vegetable sector. Now, as we know, all of the food supply operations uh, were protected and they kept running and the large, highly automated facilities that we used were able to easily absorb the small quantities of plants that we needed because of the high levels of automation. So we took that risk and it has helped us to get a lot of the plants that we need this year. Um, and surprisingly, we're probably in a more secure position at the end of the year than we were at the beginning for FLS at least. So although that was very useful and lucky, that wasn't why we were mainly interested in that technology in the first place. And that isn't why we first took it on because we didn't know. One of the main reasons why we think that this is gonna be a real game changer is because the biodegradable cells that it grows in means you can germinate it in a glass house, but then plant it and grow it in a field. So ultimately you're producing bare rooted stock. So by marrying those two together, you get all the benefits of efficient germination and efficient seed use uh, and also remove the need for soil sterilization. The system also has a specialized machine that plants those seedlings at the right spacing in the field, which by itself has saved us hundreds of hours of manual labor and led to a productivity increase of over 2000% per person. So combining all of those aspects together, we hope to have avoided uh, a lot of the catastrophes that have, could have hit the forestry nursery sector in terms of drought, basimid and lockdown. So that doesn't mean for a minute that we don't expect to come up with any more problems, but you know, we, there will be new hurdles. And we don't yet know what all of them are, but we think this could really help us to keep supplying plants, which as we've, as we've seen is something that we're gonna need to keep doing. Thanks. Well done, Josh. Thank you very much indeed. I've been, uh, some reason or another, got very, very involved with our, the Comfort's Nursery Producers Group over the last couple of years, and it's been very exciting seeing this um, work that uh, you've been doing, the tree tape trials and everything. Uh, I wish you the best of luck with the future. Um, a word of caution to everybody. Um, this loss of basimid is a serious blow um, and not every nursery is going to be automatically inclined to the investment that is going to be required to make changes either to innovate in the way that FLS is uh, trying to do and indeed de doing um, but uh, Anyway, I, 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 I think we are, we are not going to have a particularly easy couple of years and the labour situation for actually putting those trees into the ground has only got worse in the course of the last 24 hours with news that the Migratory Advice Committee has refused our, our submissions to have uh, forest workers put onto the shortage occupation lists and DEFRA have refused our um, request to treat forest workers as uh, eligible for the agricultural visa scheme that is, um, going, is still in existence next year. So a lot of the planting squads are going to have a, a difficult time with um, in, in the next year or two. And I think 
the, my, my message is, if anything, is to keep very, very close contact as managers with both your nursery provider and your, and your, um, your, your establishment contractors. And with that slightly sober note, bearing in mind the time and we've already overrun, um, uh, I think I should hand back to, um, uh, uh, to Raymond for, uh, to uh, bid you all adieu. Josh, thanks very much for that. That was uh, really interesting, some fascinating stuff in there. And uh, thanks to all our presenters, to Hamish, Gillian, and, uh, and again to you, Josh. Uh, thanks to Jamie uh, for organising this, uh, to CONFOR, the Industry Leader Group, and uh, uh, Scottish Forestry for all the, the support in, in putting these, uh, uh, th these events together. And most of all, of course, thanks to all of you for uh, attending this. I, I hope you found it interesting. I know I certainly did. And hopefully, we will all get the chance to meet again in person next spring. Uh, who knows what, what, what uh, the next few months is going to, uh, are going to bring. But uh, if not in person, then uh, I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to meet virtually once again. So uh, thanks and all the best and uh, please stay healthy. And I'll hand you back to Jamie now. One last request, everybody. Um, Turn your videos on, everybody, and I'm going to take a photograph of you just to prove you were here. Come on, turn your videos on, turn your videos on. That's great. And hang on a minute. I've got, still got uh, AC people in the room. So I need several photographs of you all. God, you look attractive, you lot, don't you? Come on. So those of you who haven't done so yet, turn it on. Right, well done. Thank you very much indeed. Great to see you all and uh, thanks for your attendance. See you back in March. Uh, we did, did fail to pick up a couple of questions uh, from the chat. I will uh, send those through to the relevant uh, speaker. And uh, as I've put in my update, this has been recorded. And uh, if you want to catch up on anything, both the presentations and the recording will be on the SFT website. Thank you again and a very good night.